Welcome, everyone. Um, Rafael Campo was born in Dover, New Jersey, to Cuban exile parents. He is a graduate of Amherst College and attended Harvard Medical School, where he now practices general internal medicine, as well as Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, where his medical practice serves mostly Latinos, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered people, and people with HIV infection. He has published a number of poetry collections, including The Other Man Was Me, The Desire to Heal, What the Body Told, and most recently, The Healing Art, a doctor's black bag of poetry. The Healing Art's central compelling thesis is that poetry has the, heal, the power to heal. If nothing else, and there is much else, Raphael Campo's work and poetic explications exhibit a more humane approach to the practice of medicine than that usually practiced. Dr. Campo has also won a number of prizes and awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, and his poems, essays, and reviews have appeared in many publications, including The Best American Poetry, 1995, The New York Times Magazine, and The Paris Review. In May 2007, Duke University Press published his fifth book of poems, The Enemy, to wide critical acclaim. The Diversity and Social Justice Project, 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 the Department of English and the Dean of the Faculty proudly present Dr. Raphael Campo. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you all for coming out on this steamy fall afternoon. I wanted to uh, uh, talk to you this afternoon a little bit about narrative and how narrative can be perhaps useful to us in medicine uh, from my vantage point as both a physician and a writer, particularly a poet. And uh, I want to make this really more of a colloquium, a kind of a discussion. And so uh, you will be, if you haven't found them already, you will be getting some uh, packets that have some poems and excerpts of uh, some prose narratives that I want to share and really base this discussion on. Uh, so again, my, my goals for this afternoon are uh, the following, and I always start with a little bit of a kind of a formal uh, setting out of goals and, and kind of a nod to my medical colleagues. If I had a slide projector, I'd have this on my very first slide. Um, I want to think about with you how medicine and narrative may be related. I'd like to examine other kinds of narratives, uh, particularly poetry and uh, a couple of short prose expert, uh, excerpts, as I said, uh, that also address the experience of illness. And then I want to think with you about some of the uh, differences between the kind of narrative of illness we find perhaps in medical discourse and these other alternative narratives of illness, particularly by considering the notion of fact versus truth. And this becomes, I think, a particularly important uh, aspect of narrative in medicine, this, this kind of tension, if you will, between fact versus truth. And really then to kind of reach with you, I hope, some conclusions about how narrative may help us to not only better understand medicine, but also healing in a larger sense, and perhaps uh, some of the health disparities that we see so commonly uh, in, in the United States at, at the moment. Uh, and so I'm going to pose a, a specific question next, which is, in the practice of the art of medicine, what are the differences between the factual and the truthful? And uh, as a kind of beginning uh, response to that, I want to read a short excerpt from William Carlos Williams' autobiography. And uh, many of you probably know that Williams was uh, perhaps the most important American poet, and he was also a physician. And uh, he didn't actually say very much about medicine in relation to poetry. He kind of uh, tended to keep the two of those uh, activities in his life somewhat separate. But in his autobiography, there is one chapter that he calls of medicine and poetry. And this is uh, something that he uh, says in that chapter. The cured man, I want to say, is no different from any other. It is a trivial business unless you add the zest whatever that is, to the picture. 
That's how I came to find writing such a necessity to relieve me of such a dilemma. I found by practice, by trial and error, that to treat a man as something to which surgery, drugs, and hoodoo applied was an indifferent matter. To treat him as material for a work of art made him somehow come alive to me. And so I'm very interested, again, in how narration, how art, how poetry can uh, make the experience of illness perhaps come alive to all of us, and particularly to those of us uh, in medicine, I think, uh, for whom the art of medicine is, is uh, increasingly being lost or is being threatened. Uh, and so, again, with that as a bit of a preface, a few more uh, questions to pose as we begin our discussion. Uh, one is uh, the, this notion of, uh, you know, for, for the um, perhaps more uh, conventionally defined artist, uh, what are the differences between fact and truth? Uh, for example, photographs and paintings as opposed to the, the object or the living being that they represent. Uh, tape recordings versus the spoken voice. Uh, we can begin to see that there may be some, some kind of a qualitative or aesthetic difference between these. Um, in the healer's work, I would put forth, this question becomes, I think, actually practically important when we uh, consider that the tension between fact versus truth, which becomes, again, very, very important in medicine in defining illness and diagnosing illness, uh, that, that these, this tension can uh, reflect, I think, somewhat the, the, some perhaps misconceptions and superstitions about illness, where illness com comes from, what is a disease in the first place? You know, I always think of, in my own uh, Latino culture, for example, the, the condition of nervios, and, and is, that a, is that a disease, this kind of anxiety that my grandmother would experience when she felt uh, upset about something? She would have a, a, an attack of nerves. Uh, well, what is that? Is that really, is that a physiologic illness, or is that some kind of a cultural manifestation of something that's distinct from illness? Uh, if we look at, uh, for example, the hospital chart as a kind of story of the illness experience, uh, how might that be different from, from what the patient coming into the hospital might actually tell us about his or her experience of suffering? Uh, in medicine, we're very focused on uh, just the facts, and I remember being told many times during my own medical training that uh, what we were interested in, in eliciting from patients were, were just the facts of the illness. And, you know the the story, the the kind of social context, perhaps wasn't wasn't quite so important. Um, and then, of course, we have the whole notion of scientific objectivity, uh, which relates. Uh, if any of you are also students of literature, uh, to the beliefs of modernist writers who who felt that in science we would have perhaps finally this kind of solution to the problem of of human suffering. That that in our Objectivity in our regard for just the thing, just the facts, that uh, that perhaps we could we could explicate some of these uh, age-old uh, problems, if you will, around human suffering, around uh, around uh, empathy, around uh, some of what I like to think of as the mysteries of of human existence. Um, I think then uh, I, I want to also put out there the, the notion of medical ease and the language that we use in, in, in medicine to describe illness and how, how perhaps the language that we apply to illness through this scientific model uh, does in some ways frustrate understanding because increasingly it's a technical language, it's a, it's a technical idiom that, that all of us don't share. And uh, so again, this tension, if you will, between fact versus truth uh, becomes, I think, very important. Uh, I want to next introduce a couple of more specific terms in relation to narrative, and, and these derive from a couple of writers whose work you may know, uh, Rita Sharon, who has worked quite a bit in the area of uh, uh, narrative and, and medicine, and then also the sociologist uh, Donald Morris. And uh, uh, we can think, perhaps, uh, of this tension, perhaps, again, in terms of a biocultural model of illness, meaning the, the story of illness that uh, uh, the patient actually lives, the, the, the lived experience of the illness, versus 
uh, what, what we might term the biomedical construct of illness, which again is, a, is another kind of story about illness, but it's the one that, that medicine, through its scientific investigations of the body, imposes upon the experience of illness. So, so those two terms I want to uh, 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 suggest that you think about also as we, as we continue our discussion this afternoon. And to illustrate perhaps, again, some of this tension, you know, a couple of examples might, might make this hopefully clearer. You know, I can think of uh, actually two patients from my own practice. One, a Dominican woman uh, living in a tenement, basically, in, in uh, Boston, uh, who I diagnosed with Duke stage 3A colon cancer. And the counterpart uh, of her, uh, another a uh, woman about the same age uh, who was a, sort of a dot-com executive, lived in Wellesley Hills, and uh, had a, a, basically the exact same uh, diagnosis, biomedically speaking, the same stage uh, cancer, the same histology under the microscope. And when we begin to look at these two biologically equivalent uh, biomedical narratives of illness, uh, we can then wonder, well, gee, are these two people actually going to have the same outcomes in terms of our response to the illness, in terms of how they understand that illness, uh, in terms of, uh, for example, spiritual uh, factors, in terms of access to health care. Uh, as we begin to look beyond the histology and the number of positive lymph nodes and what the CT scan looks like, we begin to realize that, indeed, these are actually very distinct cases, that they are not the same illness. They are not uh, biomedically exactly the same, although, again, our biomedical uh, discourse perhaps wants them to be for various reasons that I hope we'll, we'll discuss. And in fact, you know, there's actually very good data uh, from the biomedical model itself that, that tells us that these two women will actually have different outcomes of their illness, and in fact they did. Uh, my Dominican patient died after about uh, six months of, after diagnosis, uh, unable really to access care effectively despite having a physician who uh, spoke her language. And, uh, and my other patient is actually still doing uh, quite well. And, and, uh, and so again, something about these uh, two stories uh, is distinct and is actually manifest in, in what happened to these patients. Another example I can give from my practice, the, the young woman who uh, has HIV infection and who comes often to her appointments armed with you know, printouts from the internet telling me that uh, antiretroviral uh, therapies are toxic and that uh, discussions of uh, safer sex are a kind of patriarchal oppression of her sexuality and her body. And, and so again, you know, my, my uh, biomedical attempts to perhaps define her illness as CD4 cell count, viral load, uh, opportunistic infections, all of the kind of biomedical criteria by which uh, we describe the illness that we know as HIV infection or AIDS, uh, are, are challenged by her narrative of the illness. She's telling me a different story about what's happening within her body. And, and again, I want to wonder with you whether that alternative, that other uh, narrative of illness, has equal, if not perhaps more important value in understanding how to best treat that illness, how to best respond to that illness, uh, how to best... Uh, be a kind of healer in the larger sense in response to that illness. Um, and, and, and as part of that questioning, I, I, I next want to propose whether literary writing, particularly poetry and uh, literary nonfiction or create, so-called creative nonfiction, might be a kind of useful bridge between these two models of understanding illness. Might accounts of illness told through poems, uh, through other kinds of narratives uh, be useful to us in medicine uh, to become better healers, but also useful to our patients in, in terms of how to better live with illness. And, and I think that uh, uh, we, we might begin to th understand that possibility better by, by acknowledging that perhaps some of these modes of expression are 
culturally sanctioned and therefore less suspect than the biomedical model of illnesses. If we think of the African-American experience of Tuskegee and the, the skepticism, I would say, that, that uh, in the African-American community uh, that relates to biomedicine as, as a consequence of, of those events, uh, where, again, storyte storytelling, poem making, uh, expressions that come from community that are expressions of community might perhaps be, in some senses, more welcome, more useful. Uh, similarly, I think of the, the experience of, of the gay community during the 1990s and uh, the medical establishment as represented perhaps by our president during most of those years, Ronald Reagan, not acting on, on AIDS, not not saying AIDS in public. Uh, and again, might expressions about HIV and AIDS, might narratives of, of the AIDS experience uh, that come from the community, might those uh, be equally useful or perhaps again maybe even more powerful to people living with the disease in those communities. Um, so again, a kind of, and I don't want to necessarily pit medicine against uh, uh, art in, in this way, but I also I do want to uh, contrast them and, and again I think that will help us uh, to think about some of the examples that I'd like to look at with you next and uh, I think we have some copies of poems in, in the uh, out there. Do, do people have these packets? Oh, great. Well, okay, well you know what, maybe is there enough for folks to be able to share and uh, Look at look over the shoulder, or or I mean, we'll read them aloud together. Partly because we don't have enough copies, but also partly because I think the experience of hearing these out loud is part of what I'm I'm getting at in 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 uh, trying to describe a distinction between fact and truth. So, does anyone feel like reading a poem? <laughs> Any brave volunteers? We're a small enough group that. Uh, that's no volunteers. Ah, yes, great. Do you mind standing up? You, it's uh, you go ahead and read the that, the first poem in the packet. Yes, uh, it's the poem by Frank O'Hara. Oh, I'm sorry if they are. All, yeah, great. <laughs> That's great, thank you. So, clearly a poem. Um, I want to, again, as I said, have a conversation with you. So, so let me ask, uh, what, if, if you had to sort of point to a kind of a fact in, the, in this poem, what, what's the sort of the, the fact of the matter? What's the, what's, the, what's the factual thing that happens in this poem? Maybe we can start there, yes. Absolutely, and so how, and how do we know that that's the, that's the fact? What, what? It's in capitals, right, it's the headline. It's what we read in the newspaper, absolutely. So, so yeah, so that's the fact, Lana Turner has collapsed. And what, what does the poet begin to do with that fact? How does, how does the poet in a, uh, help us, I think, enter into the experience of what is a kind of a cold, hard fact of this poem? I mean, he's doing a lot. Yes, go ahead. Yes, exactly. And how does he? How does he begin to relate it to himself? How does he? Uh, how does he do that? How is it different from just reading a, a headline in, in in the newspaper? Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the ways he does it is by physically interposing himself in the poem and and how does he do that what are the ways in which he does that well a couple of things uh, there's this kind of very physical quality in the poem isn't there where 
there's the kind of the huffing and puffing of you know hailing hits you on the head hard. You really feel the the you know the kind of the exertion, the physical exertion of the speaker in the poem. So that's that's you know partly how he begins to uh, enter into the experience himself. Uh, other things that he's able to do through the medium of poetry that might not be uh, so. Uh, easily, easily accomplished through again just kind of a more standard factual narrative. How else is he doing that? How else is he inviting us to participate? Yes. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So he's actually addressing us very specifically, and and I think the way that rep, that uh, that. Uh, that kind of command, in a sense, or that that you know uh, invitation is is repeated is also part of the way that works. You know, at least in terms of the poem, uh, inviting us into into the experience. Uh, Lana Turner has collapsed, and then it's repeated. And then at the very end of the poem, there's a kind of an echo, but it's it's changed at the end of the poem. That last line, something happens where it's. That, that we go from the, the, the fact to the headline to then, oh, Lana Turner, we love you, get up. And there's a kind of, I think, empathetic, perhaps, transformation that takes place at the end of the poem where that fact has, in some sense, been made into a kind of a truth. Um, so yes, I think that's absolutely right. Other, other ways that this, this poem uh, works as a, as a way of, again, uh, perhaps, uh, Challenging the facts, if you will, and I think you know it, it perhaps has something again to do with that last line. You know, we we think. Do, does anyone actually know the narrative of what happened to Lana Turner? What what the story of her illness was? You know, she probably suffered from alcohol abuse, and so this was one of her many uh, 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 instances where she became so intoxicated that she actually lost consciousness and. And so we could look at this as a kind of a, a narrative about substance abuse, but there's also something tremendously humane that comes out of this, which again I think happens in that that last line. You know, Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. There's this there's this uh, sense of you know wanting Lana Turner to 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 be well. This kind of this human uh, identification with her, and perhaps the speaker sees his own. Uh, imperfections, his own foibles, his own uh, the, his own problems, perhaps uh, in in this figure of of Lana Turner, this iconic figure who is suddenly made human by by her by her illness, by her uh, lack of immortality, in a sense. So I think there is something of 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 the humane that gets to this notion of empathy, which I I want to talk to uh, you about a little bit more as well. Um, anything else about this poem that, that you like or don't like just before we move on? Because I have some other things to... Yes? Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and 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 I think there's definitely you know some playing around with that notion of um, you know that 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 someone's uh, failing, if you will, could be made public in this particular way. And again, I think by transforming the through through language, really through manipulating language. Um, you know, there's another uh, moment in the poem that I think speaks a little bit to what you say after we you know first encounter the fact of Lana Turner collapsing and then we see the headline the actual headline Lana Turner has collapsed you know we go from this very active language you know it started raining and snowing all that huffing and puffing we talked about before and then the headline Lana Turner has collapsed and then there is no snow in Hollywood there is no rain in California there's a way in which the passive voice that happens in those two lines uh, is a way perhaps of of, of gaining that kind of appreciation that, wait, we're talking about someone's life here, that there's some kind of uh, uh, softening, if you will, of, that, of, that, of the uh, excitement, if you will, of the, the thrill of this iconic figure, you know, failing. Uh, and, and, and I think that moment also, in a moment of, really, of narrative, of, of, of language, 
uh, that we begin the empathetic identification with Lana Turner as a human being, as, an, as another one of us. Um, so I think that's a really good point as well. So um, this next piece uh, is a little bit longer. Does anyone feel like reading this out loud for us? It's, this is a, a, about a page or so of prose. <laughs> I'll get someone, I know. All right, thank you. Yeah, if you don't mind, just because we can hear a little better. Are you, there's a mic up here at the front, too, if you like. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, again, if we begin perhaps from what we might call uh, the biomedical fact of the case, uh, what, what, what's the fact in this narrative? What are we, what are we uh, seeing here? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And again, you know, this is clearly... Uh, uh, immediately, I think, uh, an example where the, that factual uh, narrative is, is called into question by, by the speaker, by the, by the writer. And, and how, does, how does the fact of Cindy's uh, breast cancer in this, in this example, how does that begin to get transformed? How does that begin to be questioned? Uh, at the very beginning of the piece, 
we, we hear the speaker say, you know, this is, she died of breast cancer at age 26, a fact which I find unbelievable, a fact that is virtually statistically impossible. So again, immediately we're made aware of that tension between the biomedical narrative, Cindy has breast cancer, and this, the impossibility of a young woman dying of breast cancer. So how does, how does narrative then begin to help the speaker and help us on, you know, bridge that, bridge that uh, impossibility, bridge that gap, bridge that distance between the facts and, and what we might call the truth. Exactly. So, so that's a very uh, kind of human uh, response, if you will, to something that, that doesn't make perhaps narrative uh, sense is to enumerate the, the details, is to enumerate what happened. And, and some of the details are, are incredibly gripping. Uh, what are some of the ones that really stand out that, that again, make us feel perhaps the kind of the, the truth of this uh, experience? What are some of, the, some of those details that really... The dad is going to break social capital. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a, a great example of you know that uh, how this kind of truthful narrative of the illness allows for something that perhaps biomedically could not be contemplated. So so within the space of the narrative, possibilities begin to open up. Other ways of understanding this illness uh, are are made are made possible. And and that's one example. Uh, that, that you cited, I think, quite correctly. Um, other things that, that help us here in terms of, of this, this kind of narrative in contrast, again, to that sort of strict biomedical way of knowing Cindy's illness? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So what are the, what are the multiple narratives? I mean, what, what, what other narratives are in there? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the, our body, are people familiar with Our Bodies Ourselves? That very famous uh, uh, book about, about the experience of, well, it's about women's health in general, but what, what made it so revolutionary? What made it so, uh, such an important moment uh, in thinking about illness. Why is that book so important to us? Because it was really a telling of women's bodies and women's health from the perspective of women who had lived with these conditions. And uh, it was a, uh, many in the medical profession really regarded it as a kind of an affront to you know, the biomedical way of knowing about uh, women's bodies and women, women's illnesses. How dare women narrate the experience of breast cancer themselves. So in the history even of that, just alluding to that book is a, an entire narrative of, of, the, of women's health and, and attitudes towards uh, diseases that affected uh, women over the years. Uh, so, so yes, the author, I think the speaker in this piece is, is bringing that narrative into the into the uh, realm of what happens to Cindy. What else, uh, what other narratives are there since we talked about multiple narratives? That's one of the things that uh, truth-telling makes possible, again, is that there is more than one narrative. There's actually a, a multiple uh, narrative. And, it, it, and there are multiple narratives, and in fact, acknowledging that, that the biomedical narrative is itself a story. That's another thing that we often, I think, forget in, in medicine, is that the story that we write in the chart is another story. It's another product of language that describes the illness in a very particular way. So, so I think uh, the, the speaker is, is reminding us of that narrative as well uh, in this piece. Yes, other narratives? Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's a really, I think, a, a, another one of those uh, wonderful details that, that again underscores this tension between the fact that Cindy has breast cancer and the very human 
uh, impulse perhaps to to retell this as you know the, uh, and to, to disbelieve it and to to misremember it and to uh, and for for those of us who are thinking about narrative perhaps uh, from the standpoint of the artist or the writer this is a very important question as well the same question that I pose often to my medical colleagues is also relevant to the writer you know what 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 enters a narrative that we that we construct like this that maybe isn't factually truthful but yet is represented as this is what happened and so so again this is another thing through a larger understanding of narrative that can be helpful to us as artists as well if, the, if there are those of you who are looking at this more from the the standpoint of art of of being writers yourselves perhaps uh, so this comes up very commonly in, in writing workshops. You know uh, how much how much of the facts actually are being recorded, and how much is the writer's imagination, and how much again is that that impulse to look at that X-ray several times, the act of looking at that X-ray several times and verifying that Cindy's name is on it um, suggests that 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 problem of narrative, if you will. Which again, I don't, I don't think biomedicine uh, resolves any better than than the speaker in this piece does. Um, other other comments about this? Other remarks? Yes. Mm hmm. Excellent. Right. So again, you know, who was told first, and and does that really matter? You know, from the biomedical perspective, that is trivial, but from the standpoint of the speaker and the lived experience of of Cindy, that's a critical detail that that she wants to remember. But you know, again, there's some tension about that uh, in the P. Mm. Wow. Mm. Absolutely, and that's a, a reminder for those again looking at this from a more biomedical perspective. You know, often when I'm discussing this with colleagues in medicine, that you know, again, something that might appear inconsequential to us from our sort of just the facts biomedical narrative uh, actually is has all kinds of ramifications in the lived experience of the of the of the illness and the family and the the many, the myriad narratives that uh, actually comprise the story of, of, in this case, Cindy's illness. So I think that's a great point. Um, other comments? Yes. Well, I just wanted to point out that the, the question also has to do with relationships. So the mm -hmm. problem is that the father and the doctor, and the doctor, you know, she's been calling me the sister, she called Kent and the doctor. Yes. And, um, and that's telling it. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting that uh, in this particular narrative that the father is also a doctor and the, that kind of dual identity here provides an opportunity for examining, uh, again, perhaps the biomedical narrative as represented by the doctor role of the father and, again, the sort of more biocultural role of the doctor as the father of Cindy and how, again, the doctor and the father is looking at that x-ray over and over again. So, uh, as someone said before, we never would do that in the sort of standard biomedical uh, realm, uh, even though probably we should actually to verify the identity of patients. And there are many examples of, of, of uh, bad outcomes that relate to not verifying the identity, identity of a patient. But, but in that moment where he's looking at that x-ray over and over again, he's performing both roles. He's being both the father who disbelieves it and the doctor who knows this is, uh, this is terminal breast cancer. So again, the tension between those two narratives is made very clear in that particular character in this piece. So, so those are all great observations. Can we, uh, I want to make sure we have time to talk about at least two more. So maybe we'll move on to the next one, but does anyone feel like reading this one? This is a very short one. All right. Yep. During my internship and residency in Johnson City, I moonlighted on a few weekends in small emergency rooms on the Tennessee, Virginia board. I pulled 60 hour shifts Friday evening to Monday morning and a place 
places like Mountain City, Tazewell, Grundy, Norton, Allen, Lemon, and the Lonesome Pine Hospital in Big Stone Gap, Virginia. These hospitals had anywhere from 20 to 40 beds, two bed intensive care units, and an ambulance of a model population. <laughs> The ER nurses were on a first hand basis with every patient that came in. The ambulance drivers rarely resorted to the 43 year old white male with chest pain under the side of the yard. One was more apt to hear on the scanner that Lewis Tipton over on the Choctaw Hollow says old Freddy is smothering something awful and we better get over there right away. Because it's worse than the last time when he came in and Dr. Tell put him on the breathing machine. If I was lucky, no more than 1830 patients. The drive up from the mountains was breathtaking. The staff exceptionally friendly, and the cafeteria crew free and plentiful. The patients were early and appreciated, and spoke a brand of English that made diagnosis a special challenge. Who knew the fireballs and the ovaries meant um, uterine, right, <laughs> smiling honey cheeses, red spider men, <laughs> or the roaches in the liver, men cirrhosis, <laughs> Very good, thank you. <laughs> so how, how do you guys respond to this? What do you think? Well, we yeah, so we laughed. Why, are we, why were we laughing? What was funny about it? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely, so by, by uh, by giving us some of our own medical ease back to us in this, you know, kind of malapropism fashion, we we laugh at ourselves. We're able to see the ways in which that biomedical narrative, uh, with its medical ease and those terms that res resist empathetic connection, actually can be transformed through humor into a way to connect. And this speaker is a physician who I think through this narrative, the larger narrative, this is a very short piece of the book, but uh, the, the, the kind of the larger story in this narrative is the way this doctor who's, who's trained in the sort of strict biomedical narrative or model begins to identify with these patients and uh, mostly AIDS patients actually who come to this small town to die because they have, you know, there's no treatment for AIDS during the time uh, that this book was written. So. So yes, yeah, so that, that those those mispronunciations uh, humanize these folks to us without without I think you know a in a condescending way or without patron patronizing them. Um, what else? What else about this? Uh, yes. Yes, absolutely. So again, we're we're presented with a kind of uh, uh, alternative to the standard biomedical where. We're, the patients are, are known only as their diagnoses, the breast cancer in 712. You know, these folks, you know, they know their patients by name and they know where they live and they know they're placed in a whole geography, a whole community that, that uh, again, I think is, exists in sharp contrast to that sterile white hospital uh, kind of generic uh, uh, kind of environment. Yes? Also, very small numbers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's all kinds of ways in which those sort of boundaries are are violated here. You know, we you know the, the the they're on a first name basis. They, you know, the the food in the cafeteria actually isn't terrible. You know, I mean, these you know, there are ways in which this this way of 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 practicing medicine is is again presented in a more humane fashion, and again, I think poses some questions about the more standard biomedical narrative of illness. So that's, that's great. Other things that you see in this? Yes? Would there usually be a glossary of uh, translations compiled by a team of experienced ER people for newcomers that approaches and liver equals so and so? so. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea because it, he obviously learned through experience. It seems that he, he by, by listening actually to the patients for change, was able to, to develop that glossary, that, that understanding of, of their language, which again is an interesting thing to think about because usually we're asking patients 
to learn our language when they come into the hospital, and we don't we don't uh, make much effort at all to to hear them, to listen to them, to hear their to hear their language uh, in the way that this this particular physician I think begins to do in this in this narrative that that we're discussing. So, um, other comments about this? Yes. Yes. I mean, they are meaningful. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and fireballs and the other, always, <laughs> smiling, because these old things are interpretable. Yes, exactly. Say more about that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they, so they're not just sort of cute misunderstandings, are they? But they actually carry meaning about what these patients understand these conditions to be. And so there's actually even more there than just the willingness, perhaps, of this narrator to uh, hear and to listen to these patients, but also there's an appreciation of what this language may contain that uh, amplifies our understanding of how these folks live with these conditions. I mean, smiling mighty Jesus is fantastic. I mean, it's really, it's such a... And it, 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 it makes a kind of medical sense as well. So as you say, it's, it's, a, it's an expression of the lived experience of these conditions rather than, again, the sort of medical dictionary uh, version. So absolutely. So I think that's really, really wonderful. Other, other comments about this? Or? Maybe we'll go on to, let's see how much, okay, we have about 10 minutes, so let's move on to this uh, next poem, Cancer Winter. Maybe we'll read this together, and then we'll wrap up with some questions. Any, uh, any volunteers for this last poem? Yes. Thank you. Hmm. So what do you, how do you respond to this piece? What do you think? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So there's a, yes? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So she's she's using metaphor, imagery, uh, and and in some ways very beautiful language to describe what is this sort of inevitable process of of dying and her own mortality. And uh, and does anyone recognize the form in which this poem is written? Because that speaks a little bit, I think, to what you're saying as well. This is a sonnet. And what do we typically associate with sonnets? What are sonnets often used for? Love poetry. poetry. So it's rather striking that she's writing a love poem, in a sense, to to cancer. And it's a very uh, uh, provocative kind of notion to uh, to address one's illness and one's mortality through the medium of of a traditional love poem. So. So I think she's, she's, again, challenging some of those expectations that the whole biomedical narrative of this illness, cancer, imposes on her by, by trying to imagine a, writing a love poem about it. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, gesture. And again, I think it's uh, uh, something that uh, in medicine would, would feel, and when I share this with medical colleagues, sometimes does strike a kind of, you know, 
Well, why would someone want to do that? Well, again, it's a way of perhaps uh, drawing on imaginative resources, other kinds of resources to, to uh, live with this disease and to, to perhaps overcome it. So how else does she, does she uh, do that if we look at the language of the poem? How else is she, in a sense, uh, trying to overcome uh, this, this terminal diagnosis? What is, what, what is she doing in the poem? Uh, Often when I, when I read this with uh, my colleagues, people are able to almost hear the, the heartbeat here that you know, they imagine she's maybe very, very emaciated from her treatment, but, but we can almost hear the heartbeat, those iambic uh, rhythms in the poem are very, are very pronounced, very clear. And perhaps you know, by, again, representing her body in this very physical way, she's, you know, she's in some sense uh, calling up her own life force to to battle the the disease, uh, and and perhaps battle is not the best word. You know, there's all kinds of problems with this sort of militaristic, uh, metaphoric thinking about illness. But but she's she's actually because I don't think she. Well, maybe I'll pose the question to you: Is she is she? Do, does it strike you that she's sort of fighting this disease, or is she is she living through it? Maybe is that maybe a better way of thinking about what she's doing here? I think she's perhaps living through it she's per, she's persevering she she doesn't she doesn't frame it in those sort of militaristic metaphoric constructions that we're so familiar with you know from biomedicine you know we're going to eradicate the cancer we're going to you know we're going to nuke the tumor we're going you know we we have all these terms in biomedicine uh, that even when we are kind of straying beyond the strictly biomedical, the strictly factual narrative, most of our metaphoric language in medicine is very militaristic and, and pits the patient against the disease or pits us as the care provider, the doctor, uh, against the, the, you know, the good versus evil, the good doctor against the bad cancer, that kind of thing. And I think she's really actually proposing a different kind of relationship to cancer here. I mean, this is a love poem, as we said in the first place, and then she's also, again, she's not, she's not necessarily fighting the disease, but again, uh, what, what others have said about it is that they feel that she's kind of living through it, that she's persisting, she's enduring, she's, she's you know, that physical quality of the poem is, is a way of pushing past the, the illness. Yes? Yes. Mm-hmm. Just live, yes. Um, not to back, yeah. But to well, you know, and that's absolutely, and I think that's you know another really interesting point, and perhaps you know uh, something to conclude on, and then we can uh, have a, some time for some more general questions. But but yeah, you know, that's another thing that really I think is valuable about the so-called biocultural narrative of illness is that it permits various endings, that the, the ending isn't always in the cure, the biomedical cure, but perhaps there's a kind of coming to terms with one's mortality in this poem. Perhaps there is a way to love one's cancer. Uh, perhaps there, is, there are other ways of responding to illness uh, through the power of the human imagination that, that don't terminate in that sort of biomedically defined objective always of the cure. So. So I think that's really a wonderful observation as well that yeah, that this is an indifferent lover and maybe there won't be a happy ending in this particular poem. And maybe that's okay from the standpoint of this of this speaker. So that's a great point. If anyone needs to make any reasons, please do any more questions for Dr. Kanker. I'm sure we'll have questions. Yes, absolutely. I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions. So thank you for a great conversation. Thank you very much.